Welcome to Nonprofit Marketing 101. This is the first in a training series presented by the League of Women Voters and Nonprofit Marketing Guide. My name is Kitty LaRue Miller and I'm the president of Nonprofit Marketing Guide. I'm joined today by Kelly and Jennifer from the League and Christina who's our community engagement manager. She'll be helping with some of the logistics. Hi Kelly and Jenny. Hi there. Thanks for having us. I wanted to say hello really quickly. Mm -hmm. um, because this is part, a three-part training from League Easy Web, and I work on that project as a volunteer in California. Um, League Easy Web is how you make and maintain your website, and um, I'm really thrilled that that's a partnership with uh, the National League, with League of Women Voters of the United States, and um, Kelly's the person I've been working with there. Kelly, do you want to introduce yourself a little bit? Hi, everyone. I'm Kelly Ceballos, the Communications Director at the League's National Office. Thanks to Kiwi and to Jenny and the California League for helping us uh, really pull this together. We're excited to um, be able to make this presentation today. Um, I'm going to sit back and listen as well to all your great questions. Um, my uh, new media, senior new media manager, Stephanie Dryhand, is also on listening. And hopefully you know that we're both a resource for you here. Um, and we'll make sure we get you our contact information in the follow-up emails. Thanks. All right, thanks Kelly and Jenny. Let's go ahead and get started. So the first thing I want to do is have you tell me what your number one question is today about nonprofit marketing. Go ahead and find that questions window on your GoToWebinar control panel and type in any questions that you have. This will help me customize the presentation a little bit for those of you that are on the line live with us today. And hopefully I've been able to predict what a lot of those questions are. And we also have a couple other additional webinars that we'll mention towards the end. So we may end up pushing off a few of those questions until the later webinars. But let's see what you want to know about today. Gail says, how do I get attention of the media? Barbara says, with a small budget, what's the best way to communicate with voters in different age ranges, genders, races? What are some tips for doing that in a local environment? How do I drive people to our website and Facebook page? Trish is the best way of gaining relevancy in the community. Oh, Trish, I've got a hand up for you. We're going to talk about that a lot. Uh, best practices for getting nonprofits to include voting issues in the guide. How do you define projects that will lend itself to marketing? How do you increase your budget? How do we attract young people? Okay, all wonderful questions. So let's get into it. <clears throat> I do want to apologize if I end up coughing in your ear. I'll try really hard not to, but between all the shifting weather and the allergies, I'm a little cro uh, croaky here today. So we're going to do three main things. We're going to cover some key concepts in nonprofit marketing. We're going to talk about how you apply those concepts to your website and about using your website as the marketing home base. Okay, so let's get started with some of those key concepts. I promise this is the only definition I will throw out at you today, but it's an important definition because a lot of people think of marketing as being something sort of salesy when in fact it's something quite different that really depends on you being a very good listener and someone who's really paying attention to the people that you're communicating with. Marketing is creating, communicating, delivering, and exchanging offerings that have value. That value word is incredibly important to the approach that we're going to talk about today. When we think about marketing in the commercial sector, you know, that value is often stuff that people buy. You, know, you buy tennis shoes, you buy cereal. In the nonprofit world, we're not selling stuff, but we're selling things that have value, very important value to people. For organizations like the League, that value often looks like trusted information, um, access to different events or people or ways of thinking. These are things that are important to people that the league is making available to them in ways that you know might be a little more difficult for them to achieve on their own. And so that's some of the kind of value that you would provide. So we often get questions from people that are not accustomed to the idea of marketing being something that nonprofits do, like, well, isn't marketing just that fluffy stuff that you only really do if you have time? And of course, when you're looking at our definition of marketing, that couldn't be further from the truth. Marketing is really about that value exchange, and you have the goods that people want. And so we're, we're focusing on ways to communicate that's exchanging that value, that's giving people what they really want and what's really relevant to them. 
sometimes we think of marketing as a bunch of flash, right? It's got to be glitzy, and therefore it's slick, and therefore maybe it feels inappropriate for a nonprofit, especially for an organization like the League that is trying, you know, doesn't want to be all flash, but wants to be serious, neutral, informative, really helping people make better decisions. And again, it's not about being slick. It's about being valuable and being so relevant to people that you become a natural part of their everyday conversations. If you think about the best brands in the commercial sector that you like, the brand names that you use, you don't think of them as having slick marketing. You think of them as naturally fitting in to the way that you live in the world whether it's the kind of coffee you drink or the kind of clothes you wear, it's part of who you are and it's part of your everyday conversation. So we don't want slick marketing. We want highly relevant, valuable marketing for people. So, well, okay, that all sounds fine, some of you may be saying, but this doesn't really sound like it's my job. And of course, in the nonprofit sector, it is in fact your job, it's everybody's job. Getting people to pay attention to you is hard, work. You have a lot of competition from all kinds of sources. A number of the questions that are coming in from you are about this. How do we get people to pay attention? How do we get people to, to notice what we're talking about? You're competing against thousands of messages that are put into people's eyes and ears every day. And you've got to be relevant. That means you can't just pawn it off on one volunteer and say it's somebody else's job. Every, with everyone within your organization needs to work on this together and needs to understand how to effectively provide that value. We're going to do a whole separate webinar just on roles and responsibilities and how you work together as a team to make that happen. And of course, some nonprofits just say, hey, we just don't do marketing. That's not what we're all about. And again, yes, the most successful ones most definitely do marketing because, once more, it's about that value exchange. It's about finding what's the best stuff that you have to offer as an organization and delivering it to the people who want it. That's what good marketing is. So that's what we're here to do today, is to help you figure out exactly how you do that in a context that feels right for the league. As you're looking at your marketing decisions, what you're saying to who and where you're saying it, you're answering three questions all the time. These three questions should ground your conversations in marketing. And I'll tell you right now that most people want to jump to what I'm labeling as the third question, which is, what do I have to put on Facebook? Should I be using Twitter? How many times should I email? Those are the delivery questions. But you actually want to start with two earlier questions. The first one is who. Who are we trying to reach? And another way to think about this is simply, who cares? Who cares about this topic? We're going to talk about each of these in a little more depth, but let me just go through the, the three questions first. The second question is, what's the message to them? And often this includes a call to action. So what is it that you are trying to get them to do? And then why should they do it? So simply, so what? When you start talking about which communications channels you should be using, you always want to stop yourself and go back to so what and who cares. Focus on the right message for the right people before you figure out the best way to deliver that message. Okay, This is probably half of what I do as a marketing coach and consultant with nonprofits is get them to stop focusing on question number three and to deal with question number one and two. And you can answer them in either order. Sometimes you know what your message is, and you need to figure out who are the right people to hear that message. Other times you know the kinds of people that you're trying to reach, and you need to figure out a message that's going to be most appropriate for them. So it's a sort of a constant circle back and forth, but you've got to have a handle on that before you can really figure out the best communications tactics to get that message to those people. Okay. So let's, let's go back into these three questions in a little more depth here. And I do want to encourage you to uh, send in questions as we go. I don't like to, to wait until the very end of the presentation. I like to sort of take them as we go. And I'll stop at different points and try to skim over 
the questions and see what you guys are asking about. So let's focus a little bit on the who. Okay, there are a couple of things I need you to keep in mind if you're going to be successful. The first is that there is no such thing as the general public. And when I do this presentation in person, I will often make the group of people in the room chant with me. There is no such thing as the general public. There is no such thing as the general public. So you can just sort of say this out loud to yourself at home. We don't want to focus on the general public because we don't care about everybody. Let's just be honest. There are certain people who you want to talk to about certain things. And there are lots of different ways to break up those groups of people. Sometimes basic demographics works. Maybe you want to reach people of a certain age group. Maybe you want to reach people who live in a certain area. Other times, demographics don't really work. It doesn't really matter what age people are, or what ethnicity they are, or what gender they are. They're more grouped together by the things that are what we call affinities. So maybe they care about a certain issue much more than other people. And maybe that issue is important in your next election. And so you really want to find the animal lovers or the outdoorsy types or the super athletic people in your community because those people would have more of an affinity towards whatever issue it is that you're talking about. We always want to forget the idea of the general public and try to focus on these smaller groups of people because that allows us to be really relevant to those people. If you try to reach everybody, you reach nobody because what you put out is so generic that nobody can relate to it. It doesn't seem like it's for them because it's for everybody. And everybody's special, right? We all think we're special. You also need to make sure that you're not just focusing on your league members either. Okay, they are already sort of the insiders. You don't need to develop a communication strategy for insiders. You need to really think about the people that you're trying to serve within your community. And a lot of these people, you don't know their names, you don't know what they look like, but you might know how they came to your website. You might be able to tell from the search engine information, why they're there, and the things they care about. So we don't want to focus on the big general public. We don't want to come in too tightly and focus on the insiders. We want to find that sort of middle ground, the people that are interested in the things that you're talking about, but are not sort of super insiders to the league already. So again, different ways to target groups of people so that you're, you're in that right zone. So you may focus on a geographic area. Maybe you have people in a certain congressional district that you want to connect with. You may want to focus on people's behaviors. So maybe people who vote all the time versus people who never vote or have never voted before. Um, maybe people that take certain actions that are more sort of topic specific, depending on what um, legislation you're talking about. There may be particular interests that people care about. And again, one of the beautiful things about working online, both with your website and social media, is that you can get a lot of good data about what people are interested in and sort of how they're traveling around online and what they're looking at. Okay, before I jump to message, I want to stop and check in on some questions. So Kathleen says, is voters as a group too general? Uh, you know, it probably depends on specifically what you're talking about, but I would encourage you to see if you can get a little more specific than voters. Voters is definitely better than the general public, right? But I think you could probably get even more specific. Voters who what? You know, try to, try to break it down a little bit more. Uh, let's see. A couple of questions about relevance. We're going to look at that in just a minute. Same word of mouth is most effective method to engage people. How do we motivate members to talk to their neighbors in various venues? Okay, let's talk about message because this is how we get people talking. This is how we find out what people are interested in. You want to make sure that you are being relevant. Okay, so people want to see themselves in your organization, in your website, in your messaging. And what I mean by that is people have specific questions, specific interests. They think of themselves in, in different ways. 
and we want to see ourselves there. And you can help us by talking about the things we care about. Okay, so how does that? What does that mean? What does that look like? Well, it's really not about the league. So if we're looking at your brochures or your website or what you've got on your Facebook page, it's really not about the league. It's really about the league being a trusted resource on the topics that I care about or the things that I need to do. Okay, So let's look at Jane here on the screen. Maybe Jane is not the kind of person that joins organizations like the league. She's not a joiner. But you know what? She is seriously fired up about some stuff that's going on in her neighborhood. Maybe there's a local leash law and she's all amped up about climate change. Like these things are really important to her. She's reading about them all the time. And she's trying to figure out who else in her community cares too. Well, you shouldn't be looking at, oh, we need to figure out how to make Jane a member of the league. What you should be looking at is, wow, people like Jane, let's make sure that she sees us as a trusted resource. So we want to have maybe information about that local leash law or about climate change. For a lot of you, the sort of basic topics are natural things to an organization like yours that you know about. Registering to vote, redistricting, elections, the big issues in your area, whatever those local issues are, as well as some of the national issues that you see getting a lot of play in your local press. Those are the things that belong in your homepage. Those are the things that belong in your materials, not information about the league per se. Again, it's really about positioning yourself as a trusted resource as opposed to this organization that you're trying to get people to join. Now, that doesn't say that you don't ask people to join the league. Of course, you still want to do that. But that's not how you open the conversation. You open the conversation by talking about the things they care about. There are lots of different ways to be relevant. I have found that these six are sort of the easiest ones for nonprofits to do. So we've created this checklist, and whenever you're writing something, whether it's an email or a website copy or something to go online on Facebook or Twitter or wherever, make sure you're hitting at least one of these. And if you can do more than one, then you know your odds are much better for that content working. So you can download this if you go to mpmg.us slash 6R. Do not use the WWs. But you can download this little sheet and print it out and keep it next to your desk. So we're just going to go through these quickly here. So is it rewarding? Are the benefits of me following through clear? Is it realistic? So are you addressing any barriers? Okay. When we see these huge lines to vote, that's a barrier, right? People don't have time to go stand in line for three hours to get to their polling place. So that's a barrier you might want to talk about. If you experienced that kind of problem in your last election, you might want to talk about it this time and how hopefully those things have been addressed. Is it real time? Does it feel like it's happening right now? Is the context about what's happening right now? We sometimes refer to this as news jacking. So you're sort of hijacking the headlines with your stuff. You're attaching your thing to what everybody else is talking about. Obviously, in election years, years that's much easier for all of you than in off years. But you can still pay attention to what's going on in the news and connect your stuff to the headlines. It makes it feel more relevant. You want to be responsive. Maybe you're having meetings and people are talking about an issue in person, make sure you bring that conversation online. It shows other people that you're paying attention. Similarly, you want to listen to what your community is talking about through social media and bring that into some of your content too. It's how you can demonstrate that you're part of the conversation and responsive to it. People like to know new and interesting things. It's just a basic human nature. So if you can be revealing, if you can show them things that maybe they didn't know, highlight things that are going on in your community, show some things behind the scenes, people really like that a lot too. And then our final six R would be refreshing. And this is where you can do things that are sort of a little quirky or off kilter in some way, um, but maybe funny. Humor is a great way to be refreshing. You still want it to be uh, you know, authentic and real and on message, 
but you know, maybe just a little different so it catches people's attention. Social media is a great place to experiment with being a little quirky and a little surprising and a little refreshing. Okay, so always try to be at least one of these things, rewarding, realistic, real-time, responsive, revealing, or refreshing, and just play around with the word choices and the examples that you use to make the messages more relevant for your target audiences. Okay, let me see, how are we doing on this? Any questions about the six R's or message relevance? Okay, I see someone saying the link is not working. That occasionally happens with these shortcuts. So we'll make sure that this handout is part of uh, the handouts on the league website. So when you get sent an email that has all the different links to the recordings and everything, we'll make sure that the full link is there too. Those link shorteners don't always cooperate. Okay, so we've talked about focusing more on people. We've talked about really making your message more relevant. Now you have to figure out how to send that message out. And you have lots of communications channels to choose from, obviously. You want them to be a well-oiled machine that is cooperating together. We're going to focus more on your website today as part of today's webinar and this series. But you want to make sure that you don't have somebody working on the website over there who never talks to the person that's doing the email, who never talks to the person that's doing Facebook. All of that needs to be well coordinated so that people are seeing similar messages in all of those different places. It may be that someone follows you more closely on social media, but when they click over to the website, you better make sure that they see what they expect to see based on what you're putting on Facebook. Same thing with email, okay? So it's all gotta work together. There are a ton of really great resources that the League has put together for you. And one of the uh, handouts that you'll get later has a long list of the best stuff. Uh, these are some resources that are particularly helpful for the kinds of things we're talking about today, really honing in on your target audience, knowing your, what your message is, and then figuring out the best channels to deliver that message. The, the National League has tons of great stuff that you can use yourself. Steal from them. It's not stealing. They're giving it to you. Take it. Okay, use it. Social media, lots of templates. You can just copy stuff that they've given you. Huge head start, you don't need to make it up as you go yourself. Okay, so those are sort of the big concepts in, in nonprofit marketing. Marketing is something you need to do. It's a good thing. Everyone should be involved. And you wanna be asking the three questions. Who am I talking to? What am I saying to those people? And how am I delivering my message? Okay, those are your basic 101 concepts. Now let's get a slightly more sophisticated and apply them to your website specifically. Okay, so remember, marketing is about providing value to people. It's about that exchange. So how can a website provide value? There are a couple of key ways that websites do that and that you should be thinking through locally for your organization as you're building out your website. What we don't want websites to do, what bad nonprofit websites do, is dump a tremendous amount of information online and create this maze through which people have to click and scroll forever to get the little bit of information they want. Okay, so we, we don't want to create these online mazes for people. What we want to do are a couple of basic things. You want to answer their questions, you want to solve their problems, and you want to inspire them to take action. So I warned you at the top of the webinar, I was gonna have some questions for you, and this is the time. So make sure you've got your questions window open and you can answer my question. So answering questions, this should be a huge part of your website content strategy, answering their questions, okay? So think about your target audiences, think about the people in your community, not league members, not just random people out in space, general public, but think about the different groups of people in your community who have questions that the league could answer. What might some of those questions be? Go ahead and type in the questions that I might be, if I'm sitting in your community at my house, on my laptop, or even on my phone, and I'm gonna type in a question into Google, because most, most, most people are typing some form of a question into Google. 
how do I, what is, that sort of thing. What am I typing that you want to be able to answer as a league? Okay, some of the questions that are coming in. Who is my municipal clerk? When is my next election? How do I get ID so I can vote? How do I register to vote? How do I get my student away at college to vote? When is the town meeting? How do I file an initiative? I've moved, can I still vote? How do I learn about the candidates? Where do I vote? Okay, these are all fabulous questions that it would be so great if your website answered and then I didn't have to click around through the maze to get to, okay? So you wanna make sure that the, the answers are actually on your site and then on your home page, you wanna make sure that I see exactly where I need to click to get to that answer that I don't have to go through the maze. I suggest that you come up with what you think your top three questions are at any given time. And so those will often shift throughout the course of the year and depending on how close you are to an election, depending on what's being talked about in your local news. But I recommend maybe once a month, your communications committee sits down and thinks, you know, what are the top three questions that people have that we wanna answer? And you make sure those are on your homepage. Like I can go to the homepage, click, see, there they are. And then of course you also wanna make sure that your individual pages within your site kind of stand alone. We're gonna talk a little bit in another webinar about writing for the web and chunking your content and how that all works together. But of course, Google doesn't just send people to your homepage. They send, they can, Google can send people deep, deep, deep into your site, into really old pages too sometimes. So you wanna really think about where you're answering those questions, but make sure that people can get to the answers very quickly. Okay, that's one way to really establish your value is to answer those questions quickly. The other thing your website should be able to do for people to provide that value is to solve problems, okay? So some of you, some of your, your problems are in the form of a question that you just uh, sent me, but maybe I'm not um, putting it in as a question. Maybe I've just got this situation that is bothersome or troublesome for me. So what would be some of the problems that people would have that they might be Googling and that you would want your site to help them solve. Okay, more than just a simple yes or no answer or piece of data to a question, what are some problems that might involve more of a process perhaps that you could help people solve? Go ahead and send in some ideas. So, you know, getting information on candidates and ballot proposals. You know, some people might Google in who should I vote for? And most of the time you're not gonna have like the direct answer for that. You're gonna, it's, you're gonna wanna give them information that helps them make the informed decision rather than telling them what they should do. So that's a little bit of a process. So maybe, you know, one, one sort of bad way I think to do that would just be to unload all the data on them. No, here's our 55 PDF, page PDF about the candidates. No, I mean, that's, that's not gonna work, right? So maybe there's, maybe there's some suggestions that you can give people for how they go about the process of educating themselves on an issue or about candidates. How do I know if the information is authentic? Okay, so who, how do I know who to trust? Maybe there's some information you can give people to, again, help them figure out the best ways to make a decision on the issues. Who should they be following besides the league? Uh, John says city hall or the city council or whoever is not responsive, they're not listening. Okay, so that's a great problem, right? Again, not a super easy answer, but you can give people some steps how-to information, um, lists, checklists for people, step one, step two, step three kind of information is extremely popular content, okay? We call it bait because it's so good in the marketing world, okay? It's not bad bait, it's fabulous, wonderful, tasty bait that brings people to your site because that's the kind of stuff they're so desperately looking for. Specific issues some of you are chatting in. Margaret says, the problem of police brutality, what can citizens do? Again, complicated answer, 
lots of different things to do, some easier than others, but the lead can sort of lay out that framework for people, okay? Great examples, great answers to these questions. So you're answering people's questions, you're helping them solve their problems. The next thing you want to do with your website is inspire their action, okay? What is it that you want people to do? Again, answer that question for me. If there were three things that you wanted people to do and you wanted your website to inspire and enable them to do those things, what would they be? What sorts of things do you want to inspire and enable people to do? Okay, vote. That's an easy one, right? So, someone comes to your website and they want to vote, it sort of depends on who they are, right? Are you registered yet or not? I am not. Let's say I'm not registered. Okay. Well, am I eligible to register? There's a whole process that people have to go to, go through before they can actually show up and vote, right? So you want to help them through that process and you want to inspire them to go through it. So you don't want to make it seem like it's some big, hard, laborious thing. This is where the marketing comes in. You got to figure out who you're talking to and what's the best way to talk to them. What's the best message to them about doing it? You, some other things you might want to do. Be a citizen observer. Inspire people to bring their friends. Become a better uh, informed voter. Inspire people to work on campaign finance reform, to follow local politics, not just national politics. Inspire them to be a leader in their community in some way. Inspire them to visit their legislature, to talk about an issue, to attend candidate forums. Okay, so these are all great calls to action. But, again, we need to know who we're talking to and what our message is. What's going to compel them to want to do that? Why should they want to go talk to their legislature? Why should they try to learn more about an issue? Why should they attend this public meeting? You can't just preach at people. You can't just make them feel guilty. You have to really understand who they are and make it relevant to them. Okay, so this is where you go back to your six R's and try to figure out how do I really get people to do these things. And that's what you want your website to be. You want it to be answering questions, inspiring action, making it easy for people to solve problems. Okay, so we've taken the big marketing concepts, we've tried to apply them more specifically to your website. I want to talk a little bit now about how your website is really the hub of your marketing strategy, of your communications plan. Feel free to keep sending in those questions. Think of your website as the place where all paths lead eventually. All clicking online leads eventually. Doesn't mean like every single link that you put online is going to take you immediately to your website. But generally speaking, that's what the path looks like. Okay? So your website should really be at the core of your communications plan. And there are a number of reasons for this. The biggest one is because it's the only thing online that you truly control. Everything else, whether it's email or social media, has a lot of other hands on it. You know, with Facebook, they're constantly changing the way that pages work and the newsfeed works. So you can come up with a strategy that works really well and then Zuckerberg and team change up the algorithm and suddenly your stuff doesn't work so well anymore. With email, your email can be going out and there could be some new filter that Gmail comes up with or that the different spam cops, the different companies start tagging as spam. So, you know, you can control what you put in your email, but you don't control the process of delivering that email to someone else. Same thing with PR. 
we all know that you know you don't control what reporters say in the paper and oftentimes what you thought was the most important part of the interview shows up nowhere in the press again no control there when you're doing events Again, you don't know exactly what's going to happen. You don't have control over that. You've got 50 people in a room or 150 people in a room. Who knows what's going to happen? Okay, your website is the one thing that you can control. And so you want everything to sort of link back to that. You can control what's on the home page, which you can't do anywhere else. You can control what people see first. Okay, it's, it's the one place where you are truly the master of your domain online is on your actual website domain, okay? So everything else needs to sort of feed back to the website. You wanna make sure that when you're talking on social media, and you're talking on Twitter, definitely share links from other good resources, but make sure that you're sharing links back to your own site too. Same thing goes with email. Don't be throwing thousands of words out at people in email. Send them things that are short, easy to skim, easy to digest on my phone while I'm standing in line at the grocery store that I can just click on a little thing and go to your website to get all of the detail. Okay, we'll talk a lot more about writing for the web and how this really functionally works with actual content in another webinar. But I want you to, to get this sort of concept in your head that the website is really the core of your marketing system. And all of you are media moguls, okay? You control multiple broadcasting and publishing channels. We all do, all of us can. But the website should be really at the core of your media mogul strategy. Okay, so we're gonna wrap up here and then we're gonna have plenty of time for questions because you guys didn't have a ton of questions. Uh, during the session. So let's see those questions now. So what we're doing is we're summarizing. Who are we talking to? Not really the general public, not really members. You're talking to those people that are looking for a trusted source, a, a place to go to really figure out how to be engaged in their community and to get trusted information. And what's the message? You want to focus on providing value to people by answering questions, helping them solve problems, and inspiring them to take action. If you build your strategy around that, answering, solving, and inspiring, you cannot go wrong, okay? Especially if you're really focusing on specific groups of people and specific topics that people care about. You don't have to be everything to everyone. Pick the thing that you're good at and be amazing at that thing. How do I deliver the message? Remember, you're going to use lots of different communications channels, but you really want to treat your website as the hub and all of those other communications channels as spokes that are sending information back and forth. But the website is really sort of that beating heart of the communication strategy. All right, let's hear some of those final questions. Go ahead and send them in on your chat, and we'll answer as many of these as we can. As you're typing, I just want to remind you that we do have two other webinars in this series. So on November 16th, we'll be talking about communications roles and planning. So we're going to talk about things like an easy editorial calendar and figuring out who does what and how to repurpose some of that content. So we'll, we'll break down that chart with the website in the middle a lot more and really talk about, well, if I write something for the website, then it doesn't just stay on the website. How can I repurpose that into Facebook and what can I put in my email? We'll talk about how that whole system works and the people that you need to, to make it work. And then on December 2nd, we'll have more of a writing workshop style webinar where we will really teach you how to write so that your writing will be read because writing for the, the web, writing for email, social media, and online is very different than if you're writing for print. Our eyes move differently. We process that information differently. So we'll, we'll talk about that on the second as well. Okay, so let's look at some of these questions that are flying in here now. 
Should we always be serious or have some fun on the website, says Grace. I encourage you to find a good balance that feels human, okay? So, you know, I think the league's brand overall is pretty serious. I think there's some room for you guys to have fun. Now, that doesn't mean that you go do things that are way out of character. That's not what I'm suggesting. But I'm sure there are things that you could do that would be more fun. <laughs> so yes, I encourage you to brainstorm that, Grace, and to think about it. Uh, let's see. How does the webmaster know how many people are using which page? You will be able to get that information, and um, they'll be sending you, those of you that are going to participate in the, the Lou project, will be getting lots more guidance on how to figure out exactly who's looking at what and where those people came from. How do you rate the various social media platforms as investment or priorities for leagues? Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, Google+, LinkedIn. So I will tell you what the national data says, <clears throat> excuse me, not for leagues specifically because I don't work with just leagues, I work with all kinds of nonprofits. Twitter and Facebook are really the sort of king and queen, king being Facebook, queen being Twitter, I guess. I mean, they're sort of neck and neck depending on which demographic you're looking at, um, but those are really the, the, the big ones. Um, Facebook is really good for conversational content, things you want people to react to, asking questions. Twitter is really good for uh, sort of information sharing. It's a very sort of link-based network. So if you've got, you know, 10 tips for this or that, or three easy steps for this or that, that is perfect content for Twitter. So I could see where a league could do a lot of good information sharing and link sharing on Twitter, and then encourage more community conversation and more back and forth. I think that's easier to do on Facebook. Instagram, if you have things to take pictures of, is wonderful. And Instagram is definitely um, a, sort of a younger demographic now. Like Facebook, again, I'm speaking nationally here, Facebook has been kind of taken over by, you know, as old people, the Gen X and the boomers. If you're trying to reach younger, younger demographics, you typically want to try something like Instagram that is still a mainstream network but does trend younger. The, the really nice thing about both Twitter and Instagram is that they're much more public and open than Facebook, and the hashtags are a huge part of Twitter and Instagram. So everything that, that goes out on Twitter and Instagram usually has a hashtag with it. And so it allows you to sort of pull in content from lots of other voices that you might not even ever know. It's a really good place to do research on who's talking about what. That's a little harder to do on Facebook because so much of Facebook is locked down to, you know, friends of different people or people that have liked a page or are members of a group. Twitter and Instagram are much more open. And so it allows you to see more of the real conversation that's going on. There are lots of other social media networks. So some of you are talking about Tumblr, Snapchat. You know, again, I think if you have a specific audience that you're trying to reach and you determine that those are the best channels to reach those people, then I think that's fine. But generally speaking, I would start with Twitter and Facebook and Instagram. Google Plus, no. I mean, that's basically being shut down. I wouldn't worry about that. Um, shut down as a social network anyway. And then LinkedIn, you know, it, again, it really depends. I think LinkedIn can be helpful if you're trying to reach people because of who they are at work. Let me put it that way. Um, if you only want to talk to certain people because of their profession and that's how you're doing your targeting, or certain people who work at a certain company, maybe you have a huge corporate employer in town, then LinkedIn can be very helpful in those ways. Okay, let's see, other questions that are coming in. 
Some of you uh, are asking about Hootsuite. Hootsuite is a tool that allows you to keep track of a lot of different content that you're listening to as well as the content that you're sending out. So it's really, it's a management tool, especially for Twitter, but you can use it for the other social platforms as well. I'm just reading some more of the questions. Kibby, there's one that I have. People had asked um, in the questions about whether these questions are saved or can be sent out in any way with the answers, and I didn't know the answer to that one. They are saved. So um, at the end of the webinar, we can download a file that says who was here live and who wasn't, so Jenny will know if you came or not, and um, it will also have the answers to anything that you chatted in next to your name as well. Uh, let's see, Jenny, did you see any questions from earlier that you wanted to make sure I answered? I'm sort of skimming now, but if, if you remember seeing some earlier, feel free to moderate questions. Sure, well, I thought you. it was, a, yeah, I thought it was interesting. Someone had asked is how do you define a project which would lend itself to marketing? And my gut response was, well, everything could be appropriate for marketing, so I guess it depends on your overall priorities, but I'm curious how you would answer that question. How do you define a project that lends itself to marketing? Well, you know, I think I agree with you and that, you know, everything deserves a, a basic quick and dirty marketing strategy, which is who are we talking to, what's the message, and how are we delivering it. But I think in what I hear when I hear someone say what's a good project, it's sort of like, you know, what's something that deserves some extra time and attention, perhaps. Um, and so, you know, I think you have to go back to sort of what your strategic goals are for your league. So I'm just going to make something up. Maybe you really want to get people who are in a certain demographic, let's just say in their 20s, to make sure that they vote. Then, you know, that could be a project where you spend more than just sort of the quick and dirty five minute conversation on it, really thinking hard about how you're going to reach those people, what the message is, What's going to be the call to action? What are their concerns? What are their questions? I mean, this is where you really sort of go back to how can I be that trusted source? So I need to know what questions they have so I can provide the answers. I need to know what problems they have so I can help them solve the problems. And then, of course, the question is, well, how do you figure out what their questions are and what their problems are? We have to go talk to people who are in your demographic. And so you can see how this quickly becomes a project because you have to do some of this research. You have to really go talk to your target audience, figure out what their problems are, what their questions are, what they want to do that they don't know how to do, and that you can help them facilitate you know, achieving their goals. Helping yeah, other people achieve their goals is your goal. That gets me thinking, Kivy, that, that part of what um, – I think local leagues will have the biggest impact in for marketing is where they already have those connections and those skills and those resources. So instead of thinking, well, I don't know this community at all, um, so I have no connection there, I'm not familiar with what matters to them at all, and I don't really have the time to get to know them, then that's probably not the best marketing project for you. If you want to invest in that, if you say, you know, this is so important strategically for my organization that I'm going to get to know people in that community and I'm going to really invest in understanding them and I have the time and resources to do that, then you would still choose it because that's a high enough priority and, and you're committing to it. But I think too often leagues don't acknowledge that they really don't have those skills and resources and they aren't making a real commitment and so they're not going to have success. They would have done better to go with the community that they might know a little bit better. Right, and so, you know, sometimes I talk about starting with the people that are leaning your way. And, you know, lots of times we do get very excited about, oh, wouldn't it be great if all these people who lived in this community or if all these people of this age group or this demographic, you know, were excited about our stuff too. But it's unrealistic because there's too many steps involved, like you said, to actually make that a reality. So instead what you want to do is focus on the people that are already look in your direction or leaning your way and just sort of firming up your your relationship with those people and, and really doing an incredible job with those people. 
it's usually much easier and like you said, much more effective where a lot of the work is already done because you're already a part of that community in some way or you have good connections with them. That's great. Another question that I saw is um, John Spangler had asked, is there some sort of timeline limit on what's real time and what's relevant? Um, so what are some of the ways that you think about what's timely and what's not? Um, you know, the news cycle is so fast, as you all know. And so, you know, if it's, let's just say, oh, I don't know, a national political candidate makes some kind of outlandish comment. <laughs> You know, I think you want to jump on that if you were going to jump on it with something relevant related to your content. You had something meaningful to say on the issue. You know, I think you would want to try to do that at first, at least within 72 hours. What that means is that you all are sort of ready to newsjack. You're, you're ready for that. You've talked together about what your issues are, about some possible ways. Um, to connect what you're talking about to things that are going on in the news. And you can practice this. So, you know, at, at upcoming meetings or when you guys are getting together, you can look back over the headlines and, and say, okay, you know, here's what so-and-so said or did. We could have done this. We could have done that. And if you have those conversations, even if you're looking back into the past, it starts to train your brain and train your, your team for thinking that way. And so when things do happen in real time, all you have to do is get on the phone with someone and say, hey, you know, let's do this. And people are gonna, you're going to have primed the pump already. Uh, and it will be easier for you to, to jump on that and to capitalize on it. So I would say, you know, 72 hours, okay, it's, it's really good for the super newsy stuff. Um, you know, things that have a longer life in the headlines, of course, you have much more flexibility. So, um, you know, like things like trade deals, you know, just the, 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 you know, initiatives in California that are like in the press for months on end. I mean, those sorts of things are a little easier um, because they're, talked about over a much longer span of time. Mm -hmm. Great. Do you have time for one more question or I'm just sure. noticing that it's 1057. So um, a great question I see here is um, what do you recommend for internal communications among existing league members? And I'd say in particular, how do you engage the newer members that have just joined and you want to really catch their attention? So what I always recommend is to use whatever people are already using in their daily life. Like the worst thing you can try to do is to try to get somebody to use some piece of software they've never heard of and will never use for anything else. So, you know, when I think about how I communicate within my different circles, I have certain friends that we only text. I have other friends that we only Facebook message. I have other people that I don't communicate with at all unless I'm actually dialing the phone and using the phone as a phone and talking to them. So I think you want to figure out, you know, what are people's natural ways of communicating? They're already part of their lives and, and see if you can make that work before you try to add lots of other things on top of it. Great. Well, thanks so much, Katie. I see that it's 11 o'clock now. I can hear the clock chiming in the back. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for joining us today. I hope you picked up a few tips that you can use. Um, and I hope that we'll see you on the next two webinars as well. You should be getting some email follow-up from Jenny here in the next day or two. And then you will also get your registration for the next webinar. And then you'll get that reminder 24 hours in advance and an hour in advance as well. So you actually have three different emails that you'll get from us that allow you to connect to the webinar next time. Oh, and you know, on that note, Kivi, I noted that some people had 
marked emails from you as spam or blocked it. And they should know that if they do that, they won't get the invitations to the other two webinars. So we're going to go ahead and clear that out. But when you get these messages, just remember that you signed up for them. And if you mark them as spam, you're not going to be able to register, get your link unless you go into your spam folder. Yes, yes. And we may have inadvertently emailed some of you nonprofit marketing guy content that you didn't want. And that was a mistake. So we have tried to clear that up. If you decide that you actually want to be on our mailing list and get our newsletter every week, then just email me and let me know that and we'll make sure you get signed up for both. But otherwise, we will only be sending you information about this webinar series.